Well, welcome to a new Harry's Garage video. And this one, I'm actually not gonna discuss a particular car, but about storing your car with the coronavirus on top of us. Uh, everything is sort of locked down and uh, we're not really taking our sort of collector type cars out anymore. And I thought it might be a good opportunity to just discuss how do you keep a long-term storage? How do you keep your classic cars in top uh, condition when you're not using them? And it's particularly so in, here in the UK because we have these rubbish winters when they put salt on the roads. It's, you know, it's dark, it's wet uh, and cold. You're not using them then as well. So I'm going to look at it in two parts. One, where you're going to keep the car, i.e. the building and the things to consider in the building. And then two, the car itself. How do you prepare a car for storage? Because I think it'll give you some ideas while you're at home um, with something to do. It could be a DIY project or some other um, paperwork project, which I'll come to in a moment. Right, first thing, most people, when they think of what they're going to do with a garage, oh, we've got to buy a dehumidifier. Well, there's a bit more to it than that. I would actually start with the building itself, where you're actually going to keep your car. Because what you actually want, I found, is an insulated garage. And this garage, in a way, is quite tricky to manage because it's a big space. If you can make the space where you're going to keep the car smaller, then you can actually control the humidities and temperature around your car much easier. So my first tip is to insulate the garage or wherever the car is kept. Insulate the roof. This is all insulated um, through here. I mean, it's quite a lot of work, but um, it stops condensation and it also helps keep the temperature up, which is critical. The other thing you've got to do is seal around the doors because we're going to be controlling that environment and you don't want it really drafty because then your controlled air is leaking out. So that's the first thing to do. And then the dehumidifier. Do you actually need one? Well, I've got some examples here. So these are the ones I've used in the past. This is a regular condenser dehumidifier. Um, it acts a bit like a fridge, whirls away. They're relatively cheap. Um, it collects the water. There is a um, thing that collects the water at the back or you can connect a hose to it and drill a hole through your garage uh, wall and then it just leaks out. What I actually use in this building is a fixed uh, compressor uh, dehumidifier like this one over in the corner there. They're designed for indoor swimming pools and that sort of thing and that is the background dehumidifier for a big space like this. It's controlled, it adds a bit of heat as well and it's a much bigger unit than perhaps one of these portable units. But there's a different sort of um, dehumidifier, and that's this one. This is called a desiccant dehumidifier. They're more expensive. This is an industrial grade one. This is about a thousand pounds for this unit, about 1100 pounds, I think, when I bought it. And this uses a completely different principle, but the plus thing is it works at low temperatures. So while the compressor packs up at about 15 degrees and um, below, it gets less and less efficient as you go towards zero. This one doesn't matter because it adds its own heat. And these desiccant dehumidifiers work with silica gel and silica gel is that thing you sometimes find in packaging to keep the damp out. It absorbs dampness. And then it's got a big amount of silica gel in here in a pack that's absorbing moisture. A fan is blowing the, the air in here at it. And then it's heated up and it, and it then dries out the silica gel. And out of here, there's a pipe that goes on here and that blows the moist air out of the building and dry air here. What I, I thought this was going to be the answer, but it's a bit of a downside because they use quite a lot of power. It's about one and a half, two kilowatts, this thing, and it blows the hot air out of the building. So although it works and it does take a reasonable amount of moisture in, it doesn't add the heat, which I was hoping, into the building. And heat is important. Because what I've learned with these sort of buildings, if you can get the temperature up to 12, 14 degrees, all your humidity problems go away. What you're aiming at is around 65, 70% humidity in here. And here, I just checked it previously, it's about 64. And it's hard to achieve that sort of number when the temperature is low. 
during the winter here, when we have those foggy winter days, you're 95, 98% humidity outside. If you heat that same air on that winter day up to 12, 14 degrees by having the heat on, like in your house, you're at 65% um, percent relative humidity, just because you've heated the air. You haven't actually extracted the moisture, but air can absorb more moisture the warmer it gets. So the same amount of moisture in the air at 0, 1 degree, 95% say, heat that same, very same parcel of air up to 12 degrees, you're at 65. So you're better with your garage is to warm that garage up. That's why I was making such a deal about insulating your garage. Put a storage heater in there, any sort of heater, work it on economy seven and just get the temperature inside your garage up. And then you're not reliant on the dehumidifiers trying to work at low temperatures to suck the moisture out. It's a much better way of actually looking after your garage. Right, let's turn to the cars now. Now, the one thing I find with the cars, the main thing is to keep the battery charged up. And I use a trickle charger and I'm going to show you the SeaTech charger. And yes, I know they sponsor um, the channel, but I've had SeaTech chargers way longer than I've been running on YouTube. And there's a, the, they're different to other chargers. I've got some other chargers I'll show you in a minute. But what happens with a SeaTech charger, it's a very clever unit in that it will trickle charge your battery but it won't constantly trickle charge. So when it, the battery is full, the CTEC unit shows displays here, you get a green on here, knows it's full and it stops charging the battery. It, it, it will then just send it a pulse every now and then saying, oh, how are you? What sort of voltage are you doing? Oh, you don't need charging. So it never overcharges the battery. And they're, they're clever in all sorts of ways. Uh, because they can resurrect a, a, a very low battery and all sorts of things. They don't worry about the new generation lithium battery. They can cope with that as well. And then there's these accessories you can get because quite often it's quite hard to find a battery. So that's your normal leads like that, that you put on the battery, you know, plug that in. There's a socket on here, put that to the battery, but quite often the battery isn't very easy to find. So, on some cars, I've got it on the Jaguar, I use that, which plugs into the cigarette lighter, the 12 volt um, source. Not all cars have that live all the time with the ignition off, but some do, so that's quite handy. But what I tend to use, if I can, is to fit this. It's called a comfort indicator eyelet. And this has these lights on the side of it. I just pull this out. So that you put on the battery, those connectors there and then you have this hanging out somewhere and it has a sort of traffic light system on it and it then shows you it's over 80 percent if it's flashing green amber um, what is it 60 to 80 percent and if it goes red or below 60 percent it needs charging now and i've got that on the motorbikes i just noticed one of them is um, going orange at the moment they're on all sorts of things but that means i don't need so many expensive sort of ctec chargers but I can see each vehicle and what say to charge it is. And it's absolutely critical to keep the battery in good condition, especially with modern cars. Even during this coronavirus sort of lockdown, you've got to really watch it on your Ferrari 458s or our Range Rover is very critical. If the battery starts to go low, it starts to go a bit AWOL and warning lights and stuff just because it hasn't been used. So I would say a modern car it's almost more critical to have that trickle charger connected. If it's going to be sitting for more than two weeks, you need to get a you know, sophisticated charger unit on it to keep that battery in top condition and make sure it just starts instantly. P7 and P8 automatically go on charge. The older cars tend not to have the drain. So very rarely put it on the 500. So the little LAN, I do have that on a trickle charger because I like to spin the battery up. But I'll just show you, you know, this, this little Lancia hardly uses any power at all. There's no fancy electronics. There's that thing there, it's flashing green. So I know that doesn't need charge. In actual fact, that will stay months without having a trickle charger on it. Just doesn't seem to need it. The spree is different. That seems to um, like to be charged fairly regularly. Kunchash is okay. This Testarossa, I must have bought this thing two or three batteries when I first got it. 
because it will go flat. It will flatten a battery in about um, 10 days. I don't know where the leak is. I have suspicion it's got a tracker unit on it somewhere, um, but I have to keep this on constant charge. You can, this has got a battery cut out and you think, well, that's a good idea. I'll just turn the battery off. Then the trouble is all the alarm systems have gone. The tracker's sort of disconnected as well. So I much prefer to have the, everything sort of live, but a trickle charger on it. And again, these go into a funny mode if they're not on charge. Rolls Royce, you can leave for months. <laughs> Doesn't matter, and the, and the Jag as well. So charging a car, absolutely critical, particularly on a modern car. Next thing to think about is what do you need to prepare the car? How do you prepare the car for long-term storage? I always fill the tank full with super unleaded if I know I'm going to put the car away for a long-term storage. That gets rid of a sort of air void in the tank that moisture can form and it also means that it doesn't uh, give the chance, the fuel uh, the chance to oxidise quite so much because there's only a tiny bit of air to the volume of petrol. So always fill the tank with super unleaded before pushing the car away. Then the actual car itself, um, well I'll go back to the Lancia, Things to check, people say, oh, you've got to um, change the oil and things like that. Well, actually, I find the most critical thing is the state of the antifreeze in the radiator. This is an all alloy engine. Therefore, I want maximum antifreeze in the, in the radiator because that has anti-corrosive um, additives in it and it stops that aluminium going crusty, etc. cetera, while it's sat there. Next thing I do is blow the tires right up. Everybody worries about flat spots, um, on the tyres, inflate them to 35, 40 psi or something. Two advantages, it keeps the tyre in better shape and it also means if you want to move the car around it's easier to roll um, because the tyres are pumped up. It's also a good idea just to move the car like I've done like that uh, while they're in storage. That stops it getting a flat spot as well if you have the space to do it. You can get funny little protectants for the tyres but they're a bit of a pain because you have to jack the car up or something if you ever want to move it. Then if you've got a convertible car, well my tip is to actually put the roof on so it doesn't stay creased and crumpled up. It's not quite so critical on this uh, P7 but if you've got one of those electronic fold soft tops put it up otherwise it's all creased and it will stay all creased in, in, in that sort of storage area for the roof for months. It's much better to keep it stretched and taut and then take it off when you actually take it outside. Keep the windows open on the car. If you've got properly controlled space, um, air space, you know, managing it, well then you get stagnant air and you'll get um, the sort of smelly interior if you don't keep the, um, the window open. You'll see all these have got the windows open on them as well. Um, don't put the handbrake on. Handbrakes love to um, sort of stick to the disc and you think you've taken the handbrake off and you're going to move the car and it's stuck there. That's also, so don't leave the handbrake on if you can leave it in gear, but I would just leave it in neutral. Um, wash the car before you bring it into storage. Car covers are a, a, a sort of a discussion point. You see, most of these don't have car covers on. I just like the look of coming in the, in the car, uh, in the garage. This P7 has got a car cover, but the last time I used it, it got a bit dirty and there's no way I would put a car cover on it if there's a speck of dirt on the, uh, on the car. One, because it then goes inside the car cover and two, there'll be grit in it and every time you put that car cover on, you'll scratch the paintwork. So it's an absolute no-no. And when, if you do wash the car before you bring it into storage, make sure it's absolutely dry before you put a car cover on it. Otherwise it will just seal all that moisture in it. So it wants to put, it, put the car cover on after a day or two when it's dried out. Don't put it on straight away. And also, if you can, take the cars out for a drive. Now I'm very lucky because that's very easy here, but don't do it on salty roads or roads that had salt on a few days ago and it hasn't rained, it hasn't washed it off because that salt will get all the componentry underneath and there's a speck of moisture on it and then you put it back in your garage for a, another two months the damage that would do is real you know you just want to avoid it at all costs so if you can drive it otherwise like with the Alain and the little uh, Lancia what I quite often do is just spin it on the starter um, no intention of starting it so no choke no nothing um, put your foot on the accelerator just to make it spin a bit quicker and just spin it and I just see if the oil pressure comes up and then stop 
that just keeps all the componentry um, turning over. So that's the minimum of you can't actually take the car out. If you can take the car out, do go through gears. And critical thing is to touch the brakes every now and then, because something I find in, um, when you put them into store like this, one of the things they all do is the brake calipers can seize the pistons and you get binding brakes, etc. if the brakes haven't been used for a while. So there's loads of stuff you can do, even if you've, you, know, you can't take it out for a drive and you just can do it in the garage and just spin in the engine and stuff. Just while we're talking about covers, there are several sorts of covers you can get. Um, actually, two over here I want to show you. Now, this is about as simple as you can get. So this is just a dust sheet, clear dust sheet, thrown over the car. I like these just because you can see the car where it is. They're super light. They're a bit of a pain to take on and off. I'm just going to show you there. There you go. There's one of those. So I know that battery there is charged up. It's flashing green. Um, but that, that's quite easy to do dirt cheap. Or you go for the fitted, lovely cover like this on this Kuntash here. Um, they're okay. They're quite bulky is the trouble with these. But they do protect the car. You don't really need the bulk in them because it's not as though the, you keep trying to keep the car warm. All you're trying to do is keep the dust off it. And then every now and then you have to wash those covers. So you want a size you can probably put in your washing machine or something. Then if you're going to ask me which cars do I, you know, fuss over the most in here during a winter store? Well, it's probably the, um, inject the Jaguar because it had an early injection system in it and they're a bit fickle. They like to be run. They don't like sitting around. So that is one I regularly start and take out. And the same goes for the Testarossa. When I first got it, so I, was, I left it here in storage and then it had this slight misfire and you have to have the injector um, unit all rebuilt, the mechanical injection systems. They really do need running. All, sort of ca all cars, Get the early um, generation of injection systems, make sure you're starting them, running them, because they don't like sitting around. I don't know why, but they're yeah, well worth starting the most. So there you go, that's a bit of background keeping the cars, but while we're in this sort of lockdown mode, something I'd recommend to do is actually create a history file for your cars. Because part of the fun of owning these cars is just finding some of the history. This is the one for the Kuntas. If you look here, I've got, I mean, I'm really lucky this, I've got the original invoices. My car, this car was a, a motor show car. So there it is on the stand at the London Motor Show in 1987. Um, the letters to the rip first buyer, etc. But get all invoiced together. And then if, what, if it's done any, you know, I'm, it's done all sorts of magazine features, mine. So I've, this one's got loads of history. It's been on the cover of Evo a few times as well. But I mean, I'm lucky with that sort of car, but whatever car you own, just create a history file because these cars are gonna live forever. If I look at that Rolls Royce, that Rolls Royce is already 50 years old. It's gonna do another 50 years. Whatever happens, we go into electrification, etc. These will become a collector car in a different sort of sense. They will be celebrating a period, the internal combustion engine design, etc. So now's the time is to gather up their history file because it enhances your enjoyment of the car and were you able to sell it helps then as well. So I hope this has given you a bit of inspiration on how to store your car coming this winter or now while we're in lockdown. Think about that garage. Is it a DIY project you could get away with while we're all in lockdown? History file as well. And how to look after that car. I hope it gives you some tips. So when we do come out of this, your car will be raring to go and it'll just have no issues and you can go storm off to the South France or the Alps or whatever we're going to be doing. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed this video. A bit different this time. Keep watching, keep subscribing. There'll be more videos coming along very soon.